Are you struggling to conceive? You have options, and at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, we'll make sure you have the guidance and support you need. Preg is known for individualized fertility care that's unique to every patient. We take the time to provide a reassuring and empowering experience because we believe that you deserve nothing less. Let us help you on your journey to parenthood. Visit us at pregonline.com to learn more. Get the guidance and support you need at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Now screen actor Frank Lovejoy comes to the NBC microphone as reporter Randy Stone on Nightbeat. But first, let me tell you about some of our other mystery features heard on this station of the NBC Radio Network. This Sunday, the Falcon brings you mystery, adventure, and intrigue as he investigates the case of the helping hand. Later Sunday, make a date to hear Lloyd Nolan as he brings you thrill-packed listening as Martin Kane, Private Eye. And every Monday evening, you're invited to tune to this NBC station for Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy. Now there's adventure with Frank Lovejoy, starring on Night Beat. On NBC. NBC presents transcribed Frank Lovejoy in Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Christmas Eve. Jingle bells, silent night, boughs of holly. Yeah, they say there's a warmth about Christmas that spreads out like a fan and touches everyone. The holiday spirit, it's called. But right at the moment, I'm thinking of one character who was nearly left out in the cold last Christmas. None other than yours truly. Me, myself, Randy Stone. It started out like any other Christmas Eve. An exchange of gifts, a few drinks, some off-key caroling. Everybody killing time until the going-home nod from the boss. Everybody, that is, but me. No, I wasn't going home, because as far back as I can remember, Christmas has been another work day for Stone. I waited around for the noisy holiday gang to leave so I could settle down to work. And then Sam Bullock, the big boss, sent for me, and I walked across to his office. Oh, come in, Randy, come in. How are you, boss? Sit down, Randy. Oh, such politeness can mean only one thing. I'm fired. <laughs> no, this is even more embarrassing, Randy. I'm uh, going to give you a little something in the way of a present. Ah, I'll come back when you're sober. <laughs> When's the last time you had Christmas off, my boy? I can't remember why. Well, you're having this one off. Five days of it to spend with your family. Well, what family? Boss, you know better than that. What'll I do with myself? Well, a man who knows as many people as you do, well, it'll be the best thing in the world for you. Hey, yeah. Yeah, it might really be something. Say, I could call Alex Stevens. He's been bothering me for eight years to spend Christmas with his family. Sure. Or maybe Alice over in Classified. <laughs> you know, I'm beginning to like the idea. <laughs> okay, well, you'd better beat it before this noble impulse of mine evaporates. Well, you hang on to it. I'm leaving now. <laughs> and, uh, Randy... Yeah? Uh... Merry Christmas to you. Right back at you, Chief, and thanks for the break. The revelers had gone now, and the office was empty except for one man. Old Ed Collins sat watching the teletype machines. He looked up when he saw me. Thought you'd gone, Randy. No. Nope. What are you looking so smug about? Our boss gave me five days off. Swell. What are you going to do, go home? Home is a bachelor apartment on 7th Avenue. No, Collins, I'm going to call my old pal Alex Stevens in Decatur and tell him to meet the morning train. Good idea. Long distance? I want to call Decatur, the Stevens residence. Alex Stevens in Decatur. No I'll wait. Mm -hmm. Ah, phone's ringing all right. Good, good. Oh, this little floor, Alec. 
Eight years he's been after me. Must have an old maid sister-in-law or something. Careful, Randy. Tried to marry me off once when I was younger. <laughs> Should have answered by now. Oh, what's that, operator? Oh, no, no. No use ringing anymore. He must have gone out of town for the holidays. Gone out of town, eh? Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll have to settle for female company. Not home either? Well, that was a screwy idea. I don't know why I went for it. Phoning people the last minute like this? Guy, with the friends you have, you... Oh, sure, sure, sure. The friends I have, millions of them, till I go looking for one. Oh, there's a Christmas card for you on my desk. Keep forgetting to give it to you. I'll get it later. Hey, my folks only live 40 miles out. Boy, would they be glad to have you spend a few days with them. I could call them. No, and... Ed, forget it. What's a guy like me want with a holiday on Christmas? I'm shoving off, Ed. How about that envelope on my desk? Later. Looks like I might be back to play a little pinochle with you. Now, my all. all I've got to do is phone No, I'll make out all right. See you later. And have yourself a time. Merry Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Merry Christmas. I didn't want to make any more calls in front of Collins, so I headed for the nearest phone booth. Well, I made another three, four calls. No dice. Randy Stone, a guy who couldn't walk a downtown block without saying hello to half a dozen people, couldn't find one lousy bum would be his friend tonight, Christmas Eve. I went back to the office hoping some big story had broken so that I could put myself to work. Nothing come in, Ed? Not a thing. Even the thugs are home tonight. Anybody phone me? No. Uh, here's that letter I was telling you about. Oh, thank you. What's that, Money? It's a 50 cent piece. <laughs> what do you want? Your autograph? It just says, God bless you, Mr. Stone, signed Catherine Malloy. I don't know any Catherine Malloy. Hey, this is all the earmarks of an office gag and a pretty poor one at that. It's half a buck. Yeah, it'll buy a drink. Say, Randy. Yeah. I, I thought maybe you'd change your mind about going out to my folks' place. No, thank you, Ed. No, no, thank you. My ma, she... No, I said no. Uh... Ed, no, no, thank you. Outside it was snowing, light and fluffy, like it had been specially ordered for the occasion. And the people went about their business humming and singing little snatches of song. You know, oh, what fun it is to ride in the one-horse open sleigh. Yeah, there was warmth and good feeling everywhere. But my mood was more than a match for it, and I was beginning to feel sorry for myself. Like an unwanted cat, I took my mood out to get it drowned at Bobby's bar. Randy, how are you, boy? How are you? Wow. Well, what's with this place? It's like a morgue. <laughs> well, haven't you heard? It's Christmas. Yeah, I've heard. Will you put a dime in that thing and get something snappy? Okay. There we are. Hey. You lonely, Randy? Get me a whiskey sour, hmm? Yeah. That's the way it is with me, too. I don't need nobody. Nobody needs me. <laughs> it's all right, I guess. Only two or three times a year, you wish it was different. You know when it hits me? Christmas, Easter, May 17th. That's the date my mother died. But Christmas and Easter was a big time in our house. You know, we had 11 kids. Look, why don't you write a book? You act like this was something new to you. To me, it's like this every Christmas. You know, the important thing is don't be alone. How much do I owe you? 50 cents. Here. You know, when you try and fight it, you got to lose. Uh, Randy, are you going into a new business? What do you mean? Well, I thought maybe you might have gone into manufacturing. Manufacturing what? Coins. But, brother, if you are, you've got a lot to learn. This is about the phoniest half a buck I ever saw. Phony? Yeah. Give it to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. That was somebody's idea of a gag. Some half-wit in the office. Ain't much of a joke, I'll tell you. Mrs. Malloy, huh? I'll fix those guys. You gone? Yeah. Hey, well, what's your hurry? You ain't gonna leave me here alone, are you? Wait till somebody else comes in. So long, Bob. Well, you ought to stick around so we can talk, Randy. You're wasting it on me. Okay, Randy, but remember what I said? Don't be by yourself. Whatever you do, don't get to be alone. <laughs> Well, 
I stopped at the corner drugstore and bought a couple of magazines and went to my apartment ready to spend a quiet holiday. Seven o'clock. Great. Nice long evening ahead of me. Lots of time to hate the world and feel sorry for myself. I poured myself a quick drink and then somebody rang my doorbell. Yeah, just a minute. Hi. A ten, eleven-year-old kid stood in the doorway looking up at me. His face was clean, but his clothes were patched and ragged. He wore a red pullover sweater at least five sizes too big for his skinny frame. Hello, Mr. Stone. Wow, what do you want? Don't you remember me? I remember 10,000 of you. What do you want, a handout? I'm Jerry Malloy. Remember Mrs. Malloy? Who sent you up here? Whose idea was it? McFarland's, the office wise guy? My, my mother sent me. Well, you go back and tell your mother not to send phony coins through the mails. And if your mother happens to be McFarland, tell him that... She said for me to give you this letter. I'm to wait for your answer. Look, kid, take your letter and beat it. Enough is enough. She said maybe... Will you take the letter? Now, come on, what are you waiting for? I'll leave it with you. No. Here, here's two bits for you. Now, go tell McFarland the joke is over. Now, beat it before I get mad. Mother said to wish you a Merry Christmas. Beat it. I no sooner slammed the door shut when I began feeling like a heel. And I opened the door half hoping I'd find him standing there. But he was gone. But resting on the mat in front of my door was the quarter I'd given him. I picked it up and I stood there with the coin burning my fingers. I knew I wouldn't feel quite clean again until I'd found that kid and made it right with him. Somehow. I had to get to the kid, but how? The logical starting point seemed to be the newspaper office. I put my coat on. I was about to leave when a sharp knock sounded on my door. I opened the door and a policeman came in. Mr. Stone? Oh, yeah, come in. Thanks. I'm uh, Lieutenant Saunders. Know anything about this? Well, this envelope's addressed to me. Where did you get it? Do you recognize it? A kid came in here about 15 minutes ago and wanted to give it to me. You sure this is the same letter? Well, the writing's the same as another letter I got at the office. Why? What happened? Um, the boy who brought you this letter. What's his name? I don't know. He said it was Malloy, but I don't think it is. Give me a description. Oh, he's, uh, oh, 10, 11 years old. Oh, 95 pounds. Light brown hair. Wearing a faded red sweater, patched trousers. What's this all about? Hit by a car. Driver picked him up and took him away. Hit? How bad? Nobody knows. Woman who saw it from a window thinks the kid was dead. The car got away? Yeah. She didn't see the license number. When we got there, we found this letter on the street. And uh, the, uh, the kid may be dead? Yeah, it looks like it. Said his name was Malloy, huh? Yeah, that's what he said. Can I see that letter? Maybe there's something in it. Sure. What's it say? It's kind of hard to read. Hmm. Looks like some kid wrote it. Um, dear Mr. Stone, we're hoping that you'll come out to have Christmas dinner with us. I told Jerry not to leave till he brings back your answer saying yes. It's signed Mrs. Catherine Malloy. I don't know a Catherine Malloy. Well, maybe they mistook you for somebody else. I thought it was part of an office gang, and I still think so. Let me go back there and check. I'll call you later. Uh, where do you work, Mr. Stone? Chicago Star. Oh, you're that Randy Stone. Well, look, if you get any information, phone it into the precinct. Uh, hi, Randy. What's the matter with you? you? Look like you've been run over by a streetcar. Well, that's how I feel. Collins, you got to help me. Well, if I can, sure. What is it? Now, first of all, tell me. Did anybody in the office plant a phony coin in an envelope and send it to me in a Christmas card? Well, not that I knew of. Who'd pull a crazy stunt like that? I don't know. I got to find out about that kid. What kid? Well, he came to my apartment with a message, and on his way home, he was hit by a car. Bad? A driver picked him up and took him away, and the cops think that he was dead. And you don't know the kid? No. He said his name was Jerry Malloy. He, he said it like it should have meant something to me. But it doesn't. I've never seen him before. Well, maybe it's someone you've forgotten. A guy meets a lot of people in this business. Yeah, there could be. I want you to do something for me, Ed. What? Check with as many of the boys you can reach at home. 
find out if they know anything about the kid, and then phone the police and see if they've found him. If you want me, I'll be in the library. What are you going to do there? Well, something that makes me shudder, but I'm going to do it anyway. What's that? I'm going to dig back through all my stories for the past year and see if I can find a Mrs. Malloy. Maybe you didn't use her name. Well, I'll see what I can find. You get busy on that phone. Collins left me alone and I went to work. It's funny how inane some of the stuff you write seems after it's been buried. Only three of the bits offered any idea of who Mrs. Malloy might be. One, about a woman who'd refused to leave a cat in a burning house. Another, about a middle-aged lady bookie. And the last, about a woman and her family who were being evicted from a slum apartment for lack of rent money. The story was about the bystanders and how they dug into their pockets and raised 40 bucks so the woman could get back into her place. How are you doing? Well, I'm not sure, but I think I've got something. Well, I called the boys. They don't know anything about the kid or the letter. You phoned the police? Yeah. Well? They want you down to headquarters. Me? What for? To identify the kid. They think they found him. Dead? Not much chance to live. Where is he? State hospital. It's a pleasant chore for Christmas Eve, isn't it? Dandy. Well, then I guess they want me to go and see his mother and say, uh, guess what I brought you for Christmas. Oh, snap out of it, Randy. It wasn't your fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I phoned headquarters and they sent a radio car to get me. From there, we went to state hospital. Lieutenant Saunders was there waiting for me. A nurse led us down a long hallway. Severe concussions and possible internal injuries, the doc said. Doesn't think he'll live. In here. This is the boy. Go on, Stone, take a look. All right, all right. Well, is that him? No. No, that isn't Jerry Molloy. For a minute, I felt a sense of relief, but I knew I was kidding myself. Sooner or later, Jerry's body would be found, and until then and after then, I'd feel the guilt to be mine. You see, by now I knew the kid was on the level. He'd been sent to me with a message offering me a home for Christmas, and in my blind stupidity, I sent him away. Nice guy, this Randy Stone. The cops dropped me off at the paper and told me they'd keep in touch. Well? No, it's not him. What are you going to do? I'm going to find Mrs. Malloy. That 50-cent coin, that's what makes it interesting. Why money in a Christmas card and a phony coin at that? Well, maybe she didn't know it was phony. All right, then. She didn't know it was phony, but why was she sending you money? You lending the stuff out at 15%? What? Hey, wait a minute. You got something there. Maybe she did owe me some money. That woman that was tossed out on the street, 40 bucks we raised for her, she took my name and said she'd send me my five bucks back. Well, can you remember where she lived? It was on the south side. I remember the building. Yeah, I can find her. Collins, I, I can find that kid's poor mother. Well, isn't that what you wanted? I don't know. You know what I really want? I'd like to start this whole evening over again. Think you could arrange it for me? I suppose I could have let the police handle it, but I'd developed a burning need to tell her myself. I hopped into a cab and went scouting for the building she'd lived in. I hoped I wouldn't find it, and yet I knew I wouldn't stop until I did. I found it all right, right where it had always been, pressed between the ugliness of two warehouses. I hung around outside for ten minutes before I could find the courage to go and face it. Apartment six she'd lived in. I stood in front of it and listened to the muffled sounds of a radio playing dance music inside. Well, hello, hello, hello. May I come in? I've got to talk to you. Oh, I'd like very much to have you come in, but my husband, he's a bouncer in the nightclub. Maybe some other time. Look, huh? Mrs. Malloy, I I've got to talk to you. What about Christmas Eve? Go away. Hey. What, Mrs., did you say I was? Malloy, Catherine Malloy. Ah. Uh, I'm not Mrs. Malloy. I never was, never will be. My name's Mrs. Natty. Carol Natty. <sighs> you know, the more I look at you, the more I wish I was your Mrs. Malloy. But I'm not. I'm really not. How do you like that? Well, I like it a lot more than you'll ever know. 
You know where I can find her? She lived in this apartment oh, four or five months ago. Never heard of her. Uh, maybe if you ask the caretaker, he'll know. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do that. I was glad this woman wasn't Jerry's mother. I'd build a picture of Mrs. Malloy that didn't jive with a slightly tipsy frump staring at me out of hazy eyes. I called him a caretaker. Yes, Mrs. Malloy lived here, but she'd moved a couple of months ago and he didn't know where to. He told me to try Kozlov's grocery store. The storekeeper there was a living city directory. Mr. Kozlov? None other. What, what can I do for you? I'm looking for a Mrs. Malloy who used to live in the Elkin Apartments. I was wondering if you know where she'd moved to. Malloy? Uh-huh. Oh, yes, I remember her, but, but I don't know where she moved to. A good woman. Didn't owe me a penny when she left. I've got to find her. She was working steady when she moved. Wages every week makes difference. Uh, you, uh, you think some of her neighbors had know where she moved to? Oh, they, they do a big turnover in some of those places. But with wages coming in regular, I think I know how you can find her. How? It's a pattern people follow. When things can't be worse, uh, then they live in places like the Elkin Apartments. But when they're working and a little money is coming in, they move up a notch. That's the way it works. Where is this notch, this step up? Uh, it's a gamble. Uh, but if I was you, I'd try Blake Avenue, uh, somewhere around 20th. Uh, that's the way it goes, from Elkin to Blake. Sometimes back to Elkin. Uh, sometimes not. Sometimes three hours can be an eternity. It was ten o'clock now, three hours since the kid had knocked on my door. The streets were full of happy, smiling people, and the snow made everything look like a Christmas display window in one of the big stores. I'd have given ten years' salary to be like the people rushing into the stores for the last-minute presents for Aunt Agatha. I went into the stores all right, but to ask them if they knew where I could find a dead kid's mother... Took me about 15 calls to locate her. A druggist gave me her address. 1461 Burkell Street, apartment 9. Before going there, I called the office. Hello? Oh, Ed, anybody phone? Nope. I guess I haven't found him yet. Well, how about the mother, Mrs. Malloy? You think she'd have called the police by now? Yeah, you'd think so. Well, maybe she didn't phone because she thought the kid was in good hands. Well, it wasn't your fault, Randy. Well, I've located her. And uh, now comes the pleasant part of the job, telling her about it. Uh, how will I start? Uh, Merry Christmas, Mrs. Malloy, and a Happy New Year. May the New Year bring oh, you... Oh, why are you going off the deep end like this, Randy? Yeah, I know, I know. It wasn't my fault. I was just an innocent bystander. So long. I made another call, police headquarters. They had nothing new on it. The kid had turned up, they said. He'd be pretty dead, but he'd turn up. I told them I was going to see the kid's mother, that I'd located her. Lieutenant Saunders thought that that would be a swell idea. I walked down the street to Mrs. Malloy's apartment house, and I stood there a minute. From where I was standing, I could see the sign on top of the Chicago Star building. Mrs. Malloy lived only three blocks from my smug little tower. From star to empty apartment to Malloy and back to the star. But that's the way it looked geographically as well as symbolically. Another 20 minutes wouldn't matter much, I thought. So I walked the couple of blocks it took me to get back to Bobby's bar and grill. Hi, Randy. You're not making the rounds of the bars, are you? No, no. Uh, make it a double bourbon. Water. Double bourbon? Yeah, double. Not much trade tonight. Ah, oh, later they come. Um, uh, Randy, why is it hitting you so hard? You scratch a little of the veneer off and what do you find? A sentimental slob. What's bad about that? Well, then you find that you can't do things that have got to be done. Like what? What needs being done tonight? Like telling a woman that her young son is dead and that I had a lot to do with it. You're kidding. I'm not. How do you go about a job like that? Well, how did it happen? Does it matter? No. You think whiskey will help? 
close the place up, Bob, and come with me. You don't have to say anything. Just stand there with me. No, 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 no. It's a one-man job, huh? As far as I'm concerned. Well, maybe you're right. I'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. I climbed up the creaky old stairs. It was no better than a tenement house. Only one thing distinguished it from a slum, and that was a cool, clean smell. The walls were torn, and the woodwork was scarred and marred, but it was clean. I know it's crazy, but I got a lot of courage out of that feeling of cleanliness. I stood in front of apartment nine, listening. And then I knocked on the door. Who is it? It's me, Randy Stone. Mr. Stone, how welcome you are. Come in. Thank you. I'll close the door to the children's room. They are only fallen asleep, and if they hear us, they'll be sure you're Sunday. She walked away to close the door, and I wondered how I'd ever come to forget Mrs. Malloy. Her face was overflowing with a deep spiritual beauty that lighted up the whole room. She came back and sat down near me. I'm so happy you hadn't forgotten me, Mr. Stone. I was afraid you might have. Then when I was able to make a small payment on that loan, I thought I would ask you to come to see us. God will never let me forget what you did for us that night, Mr. Stone. Mrs. Malloy, I... Uh... I don't mean to embarrass you, really, I don't. But I knew if you possibly could, you would share some part of Christmas with us. I knew that the old and shabby furniture would make no difference to you. This humble home. But well, Christmas began in a humble home. Yes, that's what I told Jerry. Mrs. Malloy, uh, about Jerry, I don't know how to say it. Say what? What is it, Mr. Stone? Well, about Jerry not being home. I, I, I don't understand. The bedroom door opened and a boy walked out. I caught my breath and held it. It was Jerry. Jerry! Hello, Mr. Stone. Jerry Malloy, go back to bed this night. Oh, no, please, let him stay. Jerry, I heard that you were hurt. Oh, that. I was just shook up a little. The man drove me oh, home. Jerry, you didn't tell me about that. It was nothing. Jerry, when you knocked on my door... I told door... Ma all about it. About the way you made me come into your room and have some fruit and candy. And how glad you were when you read that letter. That's right. And he told me how you said you would get down to our house tomorrow night if it was the last thing you ever did. That's what you said, wasn't it, Mr. Stone? Uh, I, uh... I tell you, Mr. Stone, this boy of mine is uncanny. Do you know what he told me? He said he shouldn't be surprised if you came down to visit us tonight. Did you say that, son? Didn't you, son? Yes. Tell him your exact words, Jerry. Go on. Mr. Stone is no stranger. Say it, Jerry. I said I wouldn't be surprised if he even comes to see us tonight. He needs us that bad. For Christmas. In those three little rooms on the edge of the city's slums, I learned that human beings can find happiness. And don't listen to what your banker tells you. It's a thing of the spirit, not of the pocket. In that shabby little apartment with a cracked linoleum and a threadbare sofa, I learned the magic of the words. Merry Christmas. Copy, boy. Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis, edited by Larry Marcus. Tonight's story was written by Warren Lewis and Lou Russoff with music by Robert Armbruster. Featured in tonight's cast were Kate McKenna, Sammy Ogg, Ralph Moody, Jan Arvan, Bill Conrad, and Gail Bonney. Don Rickles speaking. Our star, Frank Lovejoy, and all of us on Nightbeat wish you a very Merry Christmas. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday morning, hear Mind Your Manners, and later the Somerset Mom Radio Theater starring Peggy Ann Garner. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Are you struggling to conceive? You have options, and at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, we'll make sure you have the guidance and support you need. Preg is known for individualized fertility care that's unique to every patient. We take the time to provide a reassuring and empowering experience because we believe that you deserve nothing less. Let us help you on your journey to parenthood. Visit us at pregonline.com to learn more. Get the guidance and support you need at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.